Uh, thank you for being here today. And what we're going to be talk talking about is choosing the right battery for your boat. Some of you might know me, some of you might not. Um, I hope today that you're going to get a sense of the passion that I have for boating. As an engineer, I've taken a very sort of systematic approach to problem solving, and I don't leave anything to chance. Everything's got a reason. I work through it the way that I was taught to, and uh, that's a really important way. So you just don't do something because you think you need to. You got to think about it, right? Why? And then you do it. The other big thing that I try to emphasize all the time is this concept of doing things right, following the certifications, and I'm going to be sharing some of that with you today, especially with regards to batteries. ABYC is really important. Some of you geek out and want to find out more. Uh, this one hour presentation is not enough. I did a two day course at Blue Water Cruising in November last year and another one the year before that. There's literally 150 videos on YouTube. So if you feel like geeking out or reading our articles in Pacific Yachting and now Northwest Yachting, all those articles are online. So you can actually go in and geek out with me and read more about the subject matter we're going to be talking about. And yes, I am a boat owner and I have a 36 foot sailboat, don't hate me. It could be a trawler, either way it's about being on the water. Big fan. And when I was doing this, not this presentation, but a presentation like that in Seattle, someone asked, he said, Jeff, so you're a boater. I'm like, I'm not only a boater, I work on boats, I dream about boats, and when I'm not dreaming or working on boats, I'm actually having my pleasure time, my vacation on boats. So everything I do in my life, I'm obsessed, non-recovering boat uh, alcoholic, okay? All right, a little bit about the company. So what I'm gonna be sharing with you today is really a collective experience from us actually working on over a thousand boats last year. And that experience, I don't like problems, so I try to avoid them. And I, don't, I like solving them, but I don't like them repeating themselves. So what I'm doing with you today is telling you a little bit about my shared experience. I'm not working only on my boat, but working on thousands and thousands and thousands of boats, not myself, but our team. Uh, the other thing too that's really interesting, by the way, we uploaded this presentation. It is currently online on our media page. You can actually find this whole presentation as a PDF online on our website. The whole thing is up there. And like I said, I'm reiterating this concept about YouTube is really important to us and it's a way for people to geek out about a subject matter, maybe when you're less tired or more inclined to read about batteries. All right, so what we're going to start with is marine batteries. Why this slide? I emphasize this slide and this picture to demonstrate to all of you that marine batteries come in all different sizes. There's no such thing as a marine battery. You can buy a marine battery in all different shapes and sizes, different chemistries, different manufacturers, right? So there's a lot of choice. And what we're going to be talking about here today is this concept of how do you go about choosing a battery from all those batteries that make sense for your boat and what you do with your boat. So with that, what we're gonna get started is really where batteries came from really and what was the primary purpose of a battery, right? What, why do we have a battery, at least a battery on our boat? Well, generally it's for actually starting the engine, right? It's a way for us to crank the engine, to turn it over, and that battery is meant to deliver a high amount of current in a short period of time. So that's the purpose of that battery. And that battery too is actually used also sometimes for, or similar type of battery for thrusters. Think about a thruster. A thruster is a, a load that is short, right? Five seconds, 10 seconds, three seconds, and high amount of current. So a thruster application and a starter application are gonna require the same type of battery, right? Here's the catch. A starter battery is not meant to be left in an unstate or discharge state for any period of time, right? So when you start your car and you start and then your battery goes from 100% to 99%, immediately after you started, your alternator turns on and it recharges that battery. This is very important. Never, ever, ever leave a starter battery in a partial state of discharge. That will cause the battery to sulfate and shorten its life. So it's essential that batteries are, especially starter batteries, are charged right after they're used, unlike a deep cycle battery. And how they're quantified or measured is by cold cranking amps or marine cranking amps, right? That's how it is. So, you know, you're going to figure out, you know, how big is my engine? The manufacturer might say, I want 1,400 cold cranking amps. That's where you're going to get. And different batteries come in different sizes. 
Okay, so here's an example of an 8D battery, and you'll notice what I'm highlighting with my little uh, pointer here is you've got actually vent caps, right? So this is a lead acid battery, flooded lead acid battery. It's an 8D, so it's a big truck battery. You know, you see this in the big rigs, but it's applicable for boats too. Grand Banks used to put them on all their boats. They were all 8Ds, right? And notice the vent caps mean that you actually are meant to actually top them off with distilled water, right? But what's great about a lead acid, flooded lead acid battery is if you do have the ability of topping it off, if you ever overcharge the battery accidentally, you have an ability to recover. If it's a maintenance free battery, unfortunately the damage is done and you can't do anything to repair that damage. So that's essential why I always recommend wherever possible to buy a lead acid battery that actually has the ability to be rescued, right? So you can top off the distilled water to bring back the electrolyte, the sulfuric acid mixture, to the right level in your battery. All right, so let's talk about what's the next thing. You've got deep cycle batteries, right? So a deep cycle battery is sort of like a marathon runner. It's a battery that is meant to discharge slowly for a long period of time. The capacity is measured in amp hours, and it's actually called a C20 rating. It means how long will it take, or what are the number of amps that you can discharge a battery for 20 hours? So for instance, if you have a 100 amp hour battery, the C20 would be 100 amps over a 20 hour period, meaning a discharge of five amps for 20 hours is gonna give you that battery capacity. Because remember, this is key. The rate at which you discharge a battery affects its capacity. Similarly, my ability to have a drink of alcohol is a function of time. I could have a drink every three hours and perhaps not get drunk, but if I have three drinks in 10 minutes, I'm gonna be very drunk. So the rate at which you discharge a battery affects its capacity, okay? And that's very important. That's why, for instance, you cannot run a 3,000 watt inverter on a 200 amp hour battery bank. It's just too many amps on a small little battery bank, okay? So that's why that's a factor in sizing batteries is what is the load that you're gonna apply as a function of the battery bank size. So lead acid batteries come really in three different flavors. Starter that we talked about, deep cycle, and also dual purpose. Dual purpose is sort of an all season tire. We rarely, rarely ever use a dual purpose battery. I'd rather buy a battery and install a battery for a purpose. You know, a winter tire for winter, a summer tire for winter, or a cranking battery for the engine, a deep cycle battery for the house, right? A battery for, with a purpose. Way better, way better. Now here's where it gets a little bit more complicated and you see that. People say, okay, so we've got flooded lead acid, but what about seal valve regulated batteries? Gel, AGM, Firefly. AGM stands for absorbed glass mat battery, right? And these are all lead acid batteries, but now the electrolyte, right? The sulfuric acid is in a gel state. It's an absorbed glass mat. So literally those batteries will never leak. There is no more liquid in them, right? That's why they can be mounted sideways, right? So we're doing a boat in Ladysmith where the AGM batteries are actually, they're long, and we're actually mounting them on their side as opposed to high. So that's one of the advantage with AGM batteries. In the past, 15 years ago, people would use the word gel interchangeably with SVR because gel was the first type of SVR battery. And I often find boat owners say to me, Jeff, I have a gel battery on my boat. But what they actually mean to say is, I have a SVR battery, seal valve regulated battery, which in actuality is an AGM. Very few per people here in the room have gel batteries. I'd be surprised, maybe one, two, who has a gel battery on, here in the room? Maybe. Very rare. Now, anybody show of hands, who has an AGM battery on board? Yeah, so about 25, 35% of the room. So you see, so it's pretty rare. So when somebody says they have gel, I'm like, do you really have gel or do you have an SVR battery? They're like, well, I don't know. So <clears throat> gels are a lot more susceptible to overcharging. That's why they're not popular. Okay, so let's talk about flooded lead acid batteries. So flooded lead acid batteries, I'm putting a dollar sign here, are really good price if you follow the contract and the contract is binding, non-negotiable, and that is that you will maintain that battery regardless of what happens in your life, no excuses, it doesn't care that your daughter got married, 
that you were sick, that you fell, that you can't attend to it, if the battery's not topped off, and if ever the plates are exposed, you are in a losing battle that you will never win. So lead acid batteries, flooded lead acid batteries don't die, as Nigel Calder says, they get murdered. Okay? So ask yourself, when you're looking at a flooded lead acid battery, are you able to keep that contract, a binding contract with that battery, for the next five, six, seven years, and you will never, ever, ever, ever miss a maintenance. If you do, you're gonna lose the battery and you're gonna pretend that you didn't because then you're gonna fight. You're gonna want that you didn't lose the battery, but eventually you'll give in and you'll realize that the battery is lost, you have to replace the battery bank and start over. And hence why a lot of times flooded lead acid batteries are actually more expensive than other batteries because it's hard to keep up that maintenance. Another thing too that I wanna emphasize is that flooded lead acid batteries have to have black and white, a liquid type container. Most of us have battery boxes on our boat. I'm gonna bring some bad news. At least half of you have battery boxes that are magically held into place, that there's no explanation for why the battery box does not move. And the reason it doesn't move is not because the batteries are heavy, because as we know, the sea is not always flat. We're sometimes on our sides, leaning over, and anything that's heavy and leans over slips, is that someone actually drilled four holes in the bottom of the battery box. Defeated the very purpose of the box because they didn't know how to do it any other way. And so you have liquid tight battery boxes that are compromised all the time. And how do I know this? I know this because I do about probably three, 400 electrical audits a year. That's above and beyond the thousand boats that we get to work on. And I get to see the craziness that happens on our boats. And by the way, that craziness was on my boat too. That's how I got into this business. My boat was crazy all over crazy. And so if you've got a flooded lead acid battery, you need to make sure that your battery box is liquid tight because it is not a question of if your battery will leak, it's a question of when. It will vent at the end of its life near the cap. It will never evaporate. It will leak to the bottom of the battery box and it can cause untold damage to your boat. And the other reality too is that a flooded lead acid battery only basically self-discharge at about 15% a month. So for instance, we did DFO, Departments of Fisheries and Ocean. We ended up changing all their batteries on their boats to AGM for the sole purpose that they would show up to one of their boats, they'd try to launch the boat and the battery had, would have discharge because the boat would have been unused for two, three months. So an AGM battery only loses about one or 2% as opposed to 15% a month. And lastly, what's important here is that a flooded lead acid battery has usable battery capacity of about only 35%. And this is because the ceiling of that battery while you're boating, bulk charging is around 85. And the floor is around 50%. So that range of usable battery capacity for a lead acid battery is 35% of capacity. Hence, if you have a 600 amp hour battery bank, only 200 amp hour of that battery bank is actually usable. That's why my battery banks look too big. They're too, not too big because they are. I size them appropriately so that the batteries last long. So they last for five, six, seven, eight years, as opposed to some boat owners that change their batteries after two, three years because they're working their batteries too hard. Here's an example of a flooded lead acid L16 battery. And you'll notice L16 is like a golf cart. It's made of three 2.1 volt cells. So that's why you have three vent caps right at the top that you can refill. And this is basically a golf cart battery on steroids. It's just simply bigger. So it's twice the usable capacity of a golf cart battery. The great thing about this battery is that you limit the floor space. You can literally have four of those and it's like being having eight golf carts. So it's a common way for us to add more battery capacity without adding more floor space. Because floor space on a boat, regardless that you have a 20 footer or you have a 100 footer, it always comes at a premium. We just did work on an 80 footer and there was no room in the engine room. There's no place to mount anything and it's an 80 footer. And we work on 100 footers, 120 footers and there's no place to mount anything. It doesn't matter how big your boat is, there's just more stuff on it. And so space is at a premium for all of us as boaters. And sometimes you can go up, but you can't go sideways. 
Gel batteries, we talked about a little bit, are SVR batteries, right? Seal valve regulated batteries. The challenge with those batteries is they're very finicky to overcharging. Hence why nobody or perhaps one person here in the room has them. We rarely put gel batteries on board, very rarely. Sometimes there are reasons. And notice what's interesting about a, that battery is it discharges only about 2% a month. So you can walk away from your boat for six months, come back, and the battery is still going to be about 90% of capacity. Right? That's good. A flooded acid battery, I can relate, for example, my parents have a place in Florida, and in the summer when they're not there, there is actually someone that drives their car once a month in the parking lot, does circles to keep the battery alive. Otherwise, when they would go there in November or October, the battery, car battery would be dead, right? And notice here's what's interesting, this, the range, the usable battery capacity on this gel is all the way down to 30%. So you can go from 85 to 30, that's 55% of the battery bank is usable. In other words, you only need a 400 amp hour battery bank to make a 200 amp hour usable battery capacity. So you need less batteries to do the same thing. Hence why it's worth doing the math and figuring out, oh, maybe I need less batteries to do the same amount of work I used to do before. And that's with gel. AGMs are very similar to gel. They're both seal valve regulated. They're about twice the price of a flooded lead acid battery. Limited gansing, no maintenance is required, which is key, right? Because most of us have all these ideals on the maintenance that we're going to do to battery, but in reality, never follow through it. Maybe the first year, but we can't keep it up for five, six, seven years. And again, like a gel battery, a AGM battery has a discharge floor of 30%. So you've got more usable battery capacity. All right, here's an example of on a 5788, we put 16 of those L16 AGMs. You can actually, one, two, three, four, and then four of them. So 24 volt boat, six volt batteries, four sets of quads wired. There's no jumpers, no series. This is, the guys took the picture because it's a lot of batteries, they're 120 pounds each. So it was a hell of a workout. And notice the batteries actually don't have boxes because they're AGM. So you're gonna get away with, and this is important for sailboaters. Sailboaters have even tighter constraints. It's very hard on a lot of boats to actually put a battery box. You just can't do it. You want to, but you can't. It doesn't matter. So it's an easy way to undo a problem of needing a battery box, switching to AGM, and not needing a battery box anymore. And then you'll cover the battery post, positive, obviously, and negative with cable caps or battery caps but you don't need a battery box because the battery will not leak. Here's another type of battery uh, that's really popular. I call the Firefly Oasis battery. We have some in the booth upstairs, a bunch. Now these batteries are three times the price of a normal battery, but they're 12 times the battery life. I joke around and I say to people, it's sort of like a family heirloom. You're gonna pass off the jewelry to someone and then you're gonna say to Johnny, hey Johnny, why don't you take the Firefly battery in your next boat? But literally 3,600 cycles versus 300 cycles for a flooded lead acid battery. It's sort of, it's like an elf. It's gonna die, but it's gonna live for a very, very long time. Two sizes only, unfortunately, Group 31 and L15 Plus. But the other big takeaway with a Firefly battery when you're doing the math, is that you can go down to all the way down to 20% of battery capacity. And that's essential because that's the same level as lithium. So the discharge floor on a Firefly is similar to lithium. The difference with the lithium is it goes back to 100%. A lithium battery is 80% usable. A Firefly Oasis is only 65% usable. So it's not lithium, but it's way better than flooded, which was gave you only 35% of capacity, right? And all that translates to is something called energy density. How much energy can you get out of that battery, right? For the available volume or weight that you're putting on board your boat. So we have both of those batteries in the, in the upstairs. That's a Group 31 battery, and this is an L15 Plus battery. Sort of like a golf cart, but a little bit smaller. This is another example, six Firefly Group 31s on a trawler. Uh, wired, they're 12 volt batteries wired in parallel. All right, 
This is lithium. Normally I don't talk about lithium, but every time I don't, someone always raises their hands and says, Jeff, you don't do lithium? I'm like, yeah, of course I do lithium. I, why not? I like technical challenges. I love it. A lithium is, there's no such thing as a lithium drop-in replacement. If someone tells you that, they're misleading you. They just want to sell you a battery. We did an RV, actually, a nice Prevo called RV Geeks. You can find them, they're super popular online. And we replaced, we installed a 600 amp hour Lithionix Xantrax UL battery on that uh, with, with Xantrax. But when we did that, we just didn't change the battery. We had to consider everything else on that RV. How does the chassis alternator recharge that battery? How do you stop it from charging? How is the solar gonna recharge the battery? All those variables come into play. You just can't replace a battery with a flooded lead acid battery and put a lithium battery in its place and hope it's just gonna work. Now, the purchase price is about 10 times. I was gonna put dollar signs, but I'm like, at one point, how do you count them? So it's 10 times the price of a flooded battery. Now, the cycles are crazy, right? It's not 50,000, it's 5,000, that's my bad. But it's up to 5,000 cycles on this battery, right? So 3,000 to 5,000 cycles. But notice the available capacity, it's 80%, right, from 100 to 20. And the other great thing about lithium is that it holds the voltage steady regardless of how tired it is. Think, imagine this, you, you wake up in the morning at your brightest, you work a 24 hour day, and after 24 hours, you literally have the same enthusiasm, energy level, until you pass. It's full throttle, until you can't no more. And that's really useful for applications where you're running large loads, right, like air conditioning, or these large loads, and you have to sustain the voltage. For example, I'm not sure if you haven't seen it, but it's at the Floating Boat Show, the Tactical 40 that was on the cover of Pacific Yachting. So we had the honor of doing the systems on board that boat, and they have a lithium battery bank. So lithium makes sense if you're gonna use your boat, because if you don't use your boat, you shouldn't, unless you like to brag, you shouldn't do lithium. If you're gonna go offshore, if you're gonna use those cycles, are you gonna be using your boat 3,000 cycles in the next 10, 15 years? So for offshore sailors, it makes a lot of sense. We're doing a lot of catamarans, people are going offshore for 10 years. That's great, that's 350 cycles a year, right? 10 years, great life. Less weight, less volume, faster recharge rate, all good but it comes at a huge price premium. So lithium's not for everyone. We'd probably do about maybe 20 systems a year, but it needs to be qualified. It doesn't matter if you have the money. For most of us, it doesn't make sense. It's just not required for what we do on a boat, okay? So now that we talked about, and let's recap, we talked about flooded lead acid batteries, we talked about gel batteries, we talked about AGM batteries, we talked about Firefly AGM batteries, and we talked about lithium batteries. Those are the five types of batteries that you can really choose from. The next question that you're facing is saying, okay, now that I've got sort of the battery chemistry that I'm considering, how much battery do I need? Well, how much battery do I need depends on how much power you're using a day. And that comes from calculating what your power needs are, right? What is your burn rate? You know, we all do this when we travel, when we think about retirement. How much money am I gonna spend a year? How much money do I spend a day when I'm in Europe? You know, some of us, I remember my classmates in university were spending $15 a day in Europe, you know, on a three month trip. There's no way I can pull that off anymore. There's no way the wife would live with that. So what is my daily budget when I'm traveling in Europe? Well, same thing as a boater, we have to think about what is my daily amp hour draw on my boat? How much power am I drawing on my boat every day at 12 volts or 24 volts, right? And remember, lights in the winter are running longer, so are you just a seasonal boater, just boating in the summer, or are you doing it sometimes maybe also in the winter or fall and spring season? That affects your power draw, because we're gonna use more power in the winter than we would in the summer. These are typical amp hour budgets, right? What are typical loads? I'm trying to give you an example. Not every Grand Banks owner is gonna draw, 42 the same amount of power, but it sort of gives you a barometer for what is reasonable, okay? These are sort of normal. If you don't know what the number is or you don't have a battery monitor, because if you have a battery monitor, you can tell what your daily amp hour 
consumption is. You look at what it is at midnight or 10 o'clock at night, 10 hour o'clock at night later after you've been an anchor, you start taking a running average because the past is always a good indication of the future, right? Or if you don't know, ask me and I can probably suss it out from experience and I can give you a ballpark to work from. This is an example, we just did this in December. This is 12 L15s wired on this boat. We replaced a bunch of two volt cells. All right, so you're sizing your battery bank, right? So there's a question of, and I, you've got to know this number, what is my daily amp hour budget on my boat? But that's not the only number you need to know. And then you need to ask yourself, how frequently will I be recharging my batteries, right? Because it doesn't matter what your daily amp hour, some boaters, some boaters like to be in an anchor for two days without running the engine. They might want to be there for three days. Some power boaters are saying to me, Jeff, I want to run the generator at nine o'clock in the morning and at six o'clock at night, and I don't want to run the generator from 8 p.m. to 9 a.m. I don't want to, I want complete silence. So their generator runtime might be 12 hours, 14 hours of silence, right? So we're gonna say, okay, we will need a battery bank that is gonna sustain your night loads for 12 hours, 15 hours. And some sailboat owners come to me and say, Jeff, I wanna be on an anchor for four days. I wanna go someplace, drop the hook, four days later, I wanna lift the hook, and then I'm gonna to go to another destination. So it depends. So are you gonna charge your batteries every day or every two days? And that's gonna translate, and what we get the number was called the usable battery capacity. So in, for instance, if your daily budget is 200 amp hours, and you don't want to do anything about charging for two days, you're gonna need 400 amp hours of usable. Makes sense. All right, now let's remember this. Your battery floor is set to 50 for flooded, 30 for gel, 30 for AGM, 20 for lithium, and 20 for uh, Firefly. The battery ceiling is different between lead acid batteries and lithium batteries. A lithium battery can go all the way to 100. So you have 100 to 20. Lead acid batteries go from 85 to 50, 85 to 30, or 85 to 20. So this gives you what is usable out of each battery bank while you're cruising. So, so if my battery bank is 13 volts, is that still only 85%? The question is, is 13 volts 85%? There is honestly, un unfortunately, very little correlation between voltage and battery capacity. Unfortunately, the reality is sort of like my heart rate is only an indication of my health if it's a resting heart rate. And for battery voltage, it's a battery voltage at rest after 24 hours. My heart rate is never an indication of my health because it's always got to be taken in context of what am I doing as a physical activity in the moment and what did I do just previously. If I just got off a spin bike 30 seconds ago after doing 30 minutes of spinning, my heart rate could literally be 170 beats. And am I unhealthy? Or do I should consider that I ran an inverter for the last 10 minutes or 15 minutes, right? So voltage is never, ever, ever an indication of capacity unless it's 24 hours of no loads or discharges. And how often will that ever happen to your deep cycle batteries? Never, never. Your deep cycle batteries are under load or charging when you're using your boat. You can't say to someone, honey, let's stop using the boat for 24 hours Let's recap what our battery voltage is, and let's use that to figure out our battery capacity. The only way to do that is a battery monitor. You have to have a battery monitor. There's no other way. So this is a table that summarizes what we just talked about. AGM, Firefly, Flooded. I left lithium just because honestly, most of us are not gonna choose that. It's probably 1%, 2% of us go lithium. But here's the big thing, right? With the Firefly, you've got four times the battery life, even at 20% depth of discharge. And it's 65% of the battery is usable. This is why we sell so many Fireflies. Because when you start looking at the math, it's definitely a contender. It's worth looking into, especially if you're gonna keep the boat and you use the boat. So when you size your battery bag based on the floor and ceiling, if you're gonna buy a flooded battery, you're gonna need three times the battery capacity because it's only 35% usable. AGM and gel, 55%, you gotta do twice. 
AGM, one and a half. Lithium, 1.25. That's why when you see these large battery bags on boats that have flooded with acid, it's because you can't, what you see isn't what you can take. You can only take a fraction of it. And if you take the whole thing, you're gonna ruin that battery bank. The battery bank will only use maybe 50 cycles. So for some of you out there, and you hear about these stories about boaters that stop using their battery bank when the inverter drops out and when the lights stop working, that's like you going to bed after you pass out while walking. Sure, you could do that, absolutely, yes. But that's not a way to treat your body. And don't expect that this is not a life event. I joke around all the time, I'm like, if your batteries go to 10.5 volts, and that's when you stop using them, you're causing a life event to those batteries. That is not something they're gonna recover easily from. You're only gonna get 50 cycles from a lead acid battery if you do that. That's why some people run their battery, ruin their batteries in two seasons, one season, because they're working them so hard. Until they pass out, they resuscitate them, then pass out on and on and on. And that's how you damage a battery. Now, some of us don't value money or time. Hey, that's awesome. Great for you. But if you value time and money, this is what you need to consider about. Size your battery bank so you can change your battery bank least frequently. And remember this, batteries never die at the dock while not being used. I had an owner today telling me his battery banks are 10 years old. He's thinking, should I change them? I'm like, you're 100 years old and you have not done estate planning yet. yet. It's time. Yeah, could you make it to 110? Absolutely it's possible. But maybe you should think about what's going to happen when the lights go out. He's like, oh, I'm planning to go up north. I'm like, now that's the time to think about it because the batteries are going to be working all winter at the dock and they're going to die when you're going to be one week out and you're gonna be making your passage up past Desolation Sound, and then what happens when you lose your batteries there? What are you gonna to do to replace them? There's less and less choices as you go north, right? So that's a factor at play. So look at those numbers. 200 amp hour of usable battery capacity, 600, 400, 300, or 250. That's why a lithium battery bank is a lot less battery. You can do way more with it but you've got to be willing to pay 10 times the price for it, right? So batteries come in all different size and shapes, right? And this is essential because I've got people coming to me all the time and say, Jeff, I, I've got an ED battery, it's flooded, I can't do AGM. I'm like, no, no, wait a second. Batteries come in different sizes, but they also come in different chemistries. So you can mix and match. You can have a golf cart AGM, golf cart gel, golf cart flooded. Right? You can actually mix and match. So you probably have batteries on your boat right now, a Group 31, a 4D, an 8D, a golf cart. It could be whatever, Group 24. Those batteries all exist in gel and AGM. And they exist in gel and AGM from different manufacturers. You can go super cheap, a battery you've never heard of that a guy's selling from the back of his car, or you can go for quality, like we recommend uh, North Star or Rolls, right? which is out of Nova Scotia. Right? It depends on what you do, but there is different battery chemistries for different battery sizes. And that's also flooded lead acid batteries are built for a purpose. We talked about that at the beginning of the slide. Never, ever, ever, black and white, use a starter battery for a deep cycle application. I see about probably a dozen calls in the summer of battery banks that explode because boat owners, unbeknownst to them, had starter batteries installed on their boats for reasons of cost containment and someone bought a lead acid starter battery, which is half the price of a lead acid deep cycle battery to save costs, and they use the battery in a starter application, in a deep cycle application. And by the way, when a battery explodes on your boat, it's not a firecracker. It's like dynamite. I've seen boats where the hatch got blown off and it was locked, like the hinges were torn off. And then there's battery acid in your engine compartment, and your engine compartment's full of what metal? And battery acid's made out of what? Sulfuric acid. So then you have sulfuric acid on top of metal. You want, <laughs> honestly, it's a nightmare scenario. It's literally a nightmare scenario. So never, ever, ever, ever have a starter battery used as a deep cycle application. But yes, it's half the price, but it's half the battery. It's not the same. And I use the analogy all the time. Think about a super athlete, a gold Olympic runner Marathon runner or sprinter? 
They're both top of their game. They're the best. Do they look the same? No, absolutely not. Completely different physiques. They're built for a purpose. Batteries are built for the purpose. You look on the outside, it looks the same. The construction of the battery on the inside is completely different. All right, so now we talked about batteries a little bit. I want to emphasize that I'm going to have room for questions. And this is probably so overlooked, is people have hope. They assume. And I'm telling people all the time, you know, it's disappointing, but the reality is that none of our boats were ever built and imagine the permutations or the battery bank increases in size over time. And when a builder builds a boat, they size a battery charger to be 10% of the battery bank size. Doesn't matter if it's a Bayliner, a Riviera, a Sabre, a Tardan, it could be a Hinkley, it could be a San Juan, the whole gamut. Imagine a boat, a Swan, it could be a Deller. It doesn't matter, Catalina. They're sizing the battery charger, the engineers in those departments are sizing the battery charger to be 10% of the battery capacity that you have on your boat when they sold you the boat. They didn't say, my Catalina is 1990. The engineer in the department didn't say, oh, one day Jeff's going to own the boat, but we don't know him, but we're going to anticipate that he's going to have a battery bank two times, three times the size that we put on board in 1990. So what happens is people change the battery banks, but they don't change the charger. And it's not just time. If you do not pressurize that battery with a sufficient bulk charge rate, which is minimum of 10% of capacity, your battery will die slowly and you will not recharge 100% of it. You only recharge 99. The next time you recharge, you recharge 99 of 99. And it's a slow decline. So having the right size charger is essential to maintain good battery life. Otherwise, your battery will partially sulfate, which means it will partially die, and it's gonna be a slow decline. So minimum of 10, but the good news is with AGM and lithium is that you can go a higher charge rate, meaning you have the ability of running bigger alternators, more chargers, so that you can reduce your generator runtime. I was talking to an owner today of a boat He's got about a 70-footer, and he's running the generator, 65-footer, eight hours a day. Eight hours. It's unbearable. It's crazy. I mean, at this point, I'd want it 24 hours, so I can kind of just live with it. Sort of my new reality. You know, I don't want to have silence, because I'm going to get used to it. I'm like, no, this is normal. 24 hours a day is a generator, and that's my life. Sort of like prison, right? You don't want to look outside, you're like inside. And I'm like, no, this is unacceptable. This is craziness. Like what we need to do is stack chargers, put more chargers on board so that you can reduce your generator runtime to two hours a day, right? And that's how you can take advantage of AGM being able to take up to 40% of capacity as a charge rate, right? But, you know, easily do 25. So you have a thousand amp hour battery bank, you can put 250 amps in those batteries. Firefly's even higher. And then that means that your generator, you can get a larger alternator, you can get a larger, your generator can run bigger chargers, and all of this means that it takes you less time to recharge your batteries. These are more Firefly batteries installs. This is really important. I want to show you the battery box. You see, my battery boxes are not magically held in place. What we do is we put actually aluminum L brackets all around the battery box. And coming from a sailing background, I imagine my boats not always being even. I'm imagining myself in a really bad sea state. Things are moving. And if any of you have done a Strait of Georgia crossing in bad seas, you'll know that most things are not stationary on your boat. They fly, drawers open, things fly. It gets really, it's an event. People tend to not forget it. And the last thing you want as a boat owner is your battery moving. There's through hauls around there. You cannot have 200, 300, 1,000 pounds of weight moving in your boat. So you want to beef it up, put big straps, battery boxes, you know, everything's nice and tight, do it well, right? That's secured and contained. So there's different ways of running, charging your batteries, right? Chargers, alternators, fuel cells, solar, DC generators, wind turbines, so many different ways. And your battery over here is gonna be getting all these different sources of charge, right? From a battery charger, an alternator, solar, uh, fuel cells, combiners from other batteries. 
all of this is going to go through what's called the unswitched distribution right here, all fused. I do a design, I'm going to be doing a design lecture where we're going to talk about all these individual components, not just batteries, and I'll talk about that. But basically you need to make sure that those batteries are charged at the right rate of charge from one of those devices. So a smart battery charger, right, which is a way for us to make power from the dock, convert AC power to DC power, right? So you need either a generator or shore power. And if it's a smart battery charger, it's going to say smart on the cover, we'll actually go through bulk absorption float. And that's essential because the float is what actually keeps the battery not overcharged but properly charged. And the charger can be left on indefinitely. Okay? So that's really important. And the right charge is important to keep your battery back. I had an owner that was changing their battery every two years because their charger was 2.5% of the battery bank. They had literally a 20 amp charger and they had a 900 amp hour battery bank. He had changed his battery bank twice when he called me. He's like, this is wrong, something's wrong. I know my batteries take forever to recharge, but why are they dying prematurely? It's like, it's not just a function of time. You need to do it at the right rate of charge. We changed the charger, I've never heard of them since. I would have, because now the batteries are charged at minimum, we put an inverter charger with a 100 amp charger, and now they're charging minimum 10% of battery bank capacity. By the way, I always want to say, if you're wondering if you have a ferro resonant charger or a smart charger, if it looks ugly, you have a ferro resonant charger. If it was built in a time where engineers made all the decisions, i.e. the 70s, and nobody in marketing had a say, and they have metal boxes, and it looks like out of this world. It's like where there's no aesthetics, the opposite of Apple, by the way. A third of my class went to work for Apple, and Apple, Steve Jobs is not an engineer. He makes things aesthetics, it matters. Modern chargers have an aesthetic component to it. They don't look like they're from a bygone era. So if you don't know if it's a bygone era and it's ferro-resonant, look at it. If it looks like it's from the 70s, the first Star Trek, then you have one of these. And you cannot get rid of that fast enough on your boat. That will overcharge your batteries. They used to use a word called trickle charging. They don't use that anymore. They weren't even called battery chargers back then. They were called converters. Some of you that have older boats, actually the label on the switch, it's not even says charger, it's converter. That word died, trickle charger died. Nobody uses those words anymore in marketing because they would overcharge a battery. And this is the concept of stacking multiple of those chargers to get that charge rate especially when the battery bank gets big, right? At one point, you know, you can only get the largest single charger you can get is 100 amps, maybe 150 amps. So how do you get a higher charge rate? How do you get 200, 300, 400 amps? You stack chargers. All right, I'm gonna open the floor. We've got about 15 minutes till the next presentation with questions. Yes, go ahead. question is, what happens when an owner, boater, has lead acid cranking batteries and AGM deep cycle batteries? Is there a charger that will charge both batteries with their unique charge profile? The answer is no, absolutely not. All chargers basically create an output and they replicate that output on all legs. So you can have a three bank battery charger, two bank battery charger, there's only one setting on that charger from all companies. It could be ProMariner, Xantrax, Analytics Systems, Mastervolt, Victron, whatever it is, imagine a company, Sterling Power, all battery chargers are basically one chemistry profile on all legs of the charger. So that's one of the, the complications of having mixed battery types on a single output charger. I didn't understand the question. Uh, it being the cranking amp battery is actually different from the house battery. I would, in a situation where you have different battery chemistries, right? You, for whatever reason, you inherited this problem, or you created it, doesn't matter. 
you have AGM on one side for your house and a cranking battery for your starter, I personally would choose to baby my AGM batteries because you probably have more deep cycle batteries than cranking batteries and put the charge profile for AGM and eventually your starter battery, cranking battery will die because it's not getting exactly what it wants. And then when you replace it, replace it with AGM. It's all about compromises. Yeah, question? If you don't know how old your batteries are, what's the best way to test them to find out if they need replacement? So the question is how do we test a battery because we don't know how old they are, right? What's, even if you install them, you might not know. You might have abused the batteries and don't know. Two ways. Cranking batteries are easy. They're the easiest. Because what you do is you actually replicate what a starter does. You use a carbon pile load tester and you apply a really big load, 300, 400, 500 amps. And you do that for 10 seconds and you measure what is the battery voltage after that period of time. That's easy. Cranking batteries are easy and you can do that. In our shop we have portable load testers. The challenge is a deep cycle battery. How do you extrapolate from five seconds or 10 seconds what a marathon runner is gonna do in four hours or two hours? There's no quick way of measuring a deep cycle battery. The only way of doing it is what's called a C20 test. Literally discharge your battery over a 20 hour period. Maintain the, the voltage. So let's say you have a 100 amp hour battery bank. You would actually apply a five amp load on that battery for 20 hours measuring voltage, amps, amp hours. And when it reaches 10.5 volts, you, that's when the battery's dead, officially. That's the end of the battery. You calculate the amount of time. Let's say it only did for 10 hours. 10 times 5 is 50. 50 on 100 is 50%. Your battery is 50% of what you thought it was. But that takes time. It takes patience. There's no quick, easy way to measure a deep cycle battery. And by the way, when you do that, you lose 2% of the battery capacity. Because if it's an AGM battery or gel, you've actually done a life event to it. So you're going to lose 2% of that battery bank because you brought that battery bank to death. It's like, again, you walking until you pass out. I'm not talking about you lying down. I mean, you're on your feet till you fall. That's what 10.5 volts is to a battery. It's a life event. Question? So question is, I have a boat. I've got an AD and two golf cart batteries. Which one is my cranking battery and which one is my deep cycle battery? Well, if everyone had common sense, and common isn't that common, you would have your golf cart batteries as deep cycle batteries because that's what a golf cart is. There's no such thing as a starter golf cart. Although, how often do I see people using golf cart batteries as starter batteries? All the time, why? Because most people don't like reading. They can't be burdened with reading. So they just do. And I would say your AD is a starter battery. If it was a boat I would work on, most likely the AD is a starter. And your golf carts, which are only deep cycle, there's no such thing as a starter golf cart. No such thing. Although they're used often for that application. Um, those are probably your deep cycle batteries. That would be an educated, common sense approach to your boat. Question in the back? Yeah, the question is, can a smart battery charger be kept on all the time? And the answer is yes, absolutely. My battery charger on my boat is a smart battery charger, and it's not like the newest and greatest. It's a Xantrax uh, True Sign or Pure Sign Inverter Charger that was probably built in 2003, 2002. And it is on my boat 24 seven, unless I'm not connected to shore power, 24 seven. Never had a problem. But you need, and you need to have the right settings on your charger. You can't have a battery charger smart and you have AGM and you configure it for gel or have, I don't know, flooded batteries and have it configured for AGM. Like, and by the way, a lot of you, this is disconcerting, but true, most of you that have smart battery chargers do not have it configured properly. You don't. Like probably at least half of you in the room. If I came on board, it's probably flooded, most likely, and everything's default, or some of the dis dip switches on them can be changed by just rubbing on them. Most of it's just random. It's gonna be random. Because you assume it's fine. You don't want to look into it. You're like, well, it's probably fine. I think someone did it. I hope it's there. And then you just ignore it. But unfortunately, the settings are probably wrong. Yes? Yeah, so there's a thing about what happens if you've got, so we install in this gentleman Firefly batteries. 
and he's asking, are there such a thing as programmable battery chargers? And there are. Depending on the type of battery charger you buy, you need to buy a more expensive one. Like for example, Victron, right? Or even Mastervolt, or an inverter charger, right? These are easily programmable. You'll actually go in with a laptop and we'll geek out and actually put in a charge profile that matches exactly what the manufacturer wants. That being said, sometimes you can't do that. Like for example, Zantrax, the True Charge 2, you can't program. You have to choose, or even ProMariner, you have to choose the battery profile that matches the most closely to what you're doing, right? And so you'll use one of the buttons and say, I have an AGM-1 or AGM-2, and they'll create two charge profiles that they're thinking that are the most popular, and you'll choose one of the two that's the best. So as you go up, the more expensive chargers are gonna give you more options for programming. Inverter chargers do that, like a Magnum or a Xantrax or Mastervolt or Victron allow you in an inverter charger to actually configure the charge profile. So what would you program, like the amount of time for bulk of storage? Yeah, so what are the things you would have, so the question is what would you, okay, this now we're geeking out. I call this going down a rabbit hole, okay? Like, let's go, like, if people fall asleep here, I will not be insulted, okay? <laughs> But for example, if our, every battery is different. Everything is different. Nothing is easy. Rule number one, always go back to rule one. Nothing is ever easy. Firefly battery, bulk 14.4, temperature compensated. Float 13.4, temperature compensated. And absorption timer is a function of your battery bank size. And that's a long formula, and I'm not gonna do this here because people are gonna run for the exits, okay? Like, I, no, I can't do that. It's, it's a formula. But the absorption timer is a function of so you your battery bank that, size. You can program those two. Yeah, absolutely. And a Magnum, Xantrex, you can do that. You can geek out. Absolutely. More questions? They still may suggest to me that distilled water, you can use the water out of your holding, uh, not holding tank, out of your, uh, your regular tank, tank on, on board. No. No, question is, should we, I've got flooded lead acid batteries on my boat. What kind of water should I use to top off the batteries? The only water you should use is distilled. Distilled water is pure water, it's stage 2 You wouldn't drink it, it's awful, but that's what water is. All the water that we drink has minerals in them. Those minerals would affect your battery. The only thing that works is distilled water. So you go to a pharmacy, you buy some jugs, and you buy distilled water. A lot of people have CPAP machines now, it's pretty common, they use distilled water. That's what you need, you need distilled water. It's gotta be H2O, absolutely, black and white. Again. It's gonna make your batteries last longer, so you don't have to do it, but if you value your time and money, you're gonna use distilled water. Okay, other question? All right, question. Are those devices that you see that are made by third-party manufacturers, battery maintainers, and there might be someone who manufactures them here in the room. I always ask myself, if Nigel Calder never talks about it, no battery manufacturer's ever built one, no reputable battery charger makes one, and it's always a company that you've never heard of for a period of time, and then they just appear and a new one comes in, are those devices worth the money to maintain a battery? These pulses and stuff like that? I'm gonna go no. Because if something was worth doing, Victron would have done it, Mastervolt would have done it, Magnum would have done it, Outback would have done it, every company would have done it, and battery manufacturers would have done it. You'd have East Pendeca building them, Trojan would do them, Interstate, North Star, Rolls. Nobody talks about it. The only people that talk about them is someone in a booth at a trade show. So you, I'm not telling you they don't work, but you do the math based on this information. So I don't want to insult anybody here in the room that's in that business. All right, any other questions? Yes? Question is, if I have flooded batteries on my boat, should I get rid of them after seven years? Seven years, you're starting to get in the lucky period. It depends. You know, if you don't use your boat, you don't have to change your batteries. But if you use your boat and you go further and further north, the question is, how much of a hassle is it gonna be, and how much do you wanna push your luck? Because one day you will have a failure, and not all batteries are a slow death. Suddenly it's a sudden death, right? It's like, it's fine, fine, relatively, and then it's nothing. And what is that gonna to do to you when you're boating? Do you have three months, and you can go back to Port McNeil or Port Hardy and wait it out for a week or two? 
Or do you don't have time and you're only a month and it matters to you? I don't want to tell you what to do with money because you don't want to spend money you don't have to today. But what, how painful is it going to be to deal with a battery change later? And I would say with flooded lead acid, after seven years, you're starting to get pretty lucky. Yeah, of course it can last to 10. Absolutely. Some people make it to 100. But at one point, you got to ask yourself, you know, how lucky am I going to be? Right? And are you going to affect change here when things are easy and controllable under your time? Or are you going to affect change when you're out there and then you lose your fridge, right? You lose your meats, you lose your food, you got to come back to port. What's that worth to you? Yes? Question? I'll come. Yeah, go ahead. Is there any value in your old battery? Somebody told me they, in Ontario, they took back an AT through a metal recycler and about 100 bucks for it. Yeah, the question is, is there any value out of an old battery? Well, certainly there is value. There is a right, I mean, an AD weighs 160 pounds. So, I mean, it's, I think here in Vancouver, it's around 40 bucks, $45, that the battery shops do not throw those batteries away. You'll get $45 for a battery if you bring it back to the battery depot. So, yes, there is worth in those batteries. That's the big ones, not the. Uh... Those are big ones. Those are ADs. That's a 160 pound battery. A golf cart's like 10 bucks, $15. Question in the back? AGM is going to be another two years above and beyond flooded. Three years, right? It's about 50%. So if you got five to seven years for flooded, you might get six to nine with AGM on average. There's always outliers, right? Some people live to 110. But I mean, I'm certainly not basing my life expectancy on those sort of numbers, right? So, yes, question. Question is, if I've got three batteries in parallel in a battery bank, right, working as one, and one has failed, what do I do? Unfortunately, battery banks need to age together. And realistically, you can't change one. Now, if the battery bank failed and you put it in yesterday, no problem. But after about a year, about 20, 30, 40 cycles, the battery banks have to be the same age. And that's what's so painful about premature battery failure. You don't just replace a battery. When you've got a tire after three, four years that fails, you don't replace one tire, you replace them all. They all have to age the same. All right? Oh yeah, equalization. Question is, what about equalization mode on battery chargers? That sounds like a great idea, a great idea, but the execution of that idea, and I, do, I have a video on that, on equalization on YouTube, and it would take about three minutes. I can't really go there. It's very tedious to do that. It's great, sounds awesome, but the implications to do that on your boat are very intense. It's great to do in a garage, on a battery bench, but on your boat, it's very hard to do that without, there are implications. To tell you the truth, I had my flooded lead acid batteries lasted 10 years on my boat. And they were still working when I changed them to Firefly, and I never did equalization. So it's not to say they wouldn't have lasted longer, but at one point you've got to ask yourself, are you asking too much out of your batteries? So I'm going to, honestly, it's one I'm, or five. So we're going to have to switch over. I'm going to take questions on the next one because now we're going to start inverter presentation.